tomorrow. Warner Brothers presents the most passionately read love story of our time. Clint Eastwood, Meryl Streep. The Bridges of Madison County. And a hearty welcome to one and all. We're back in the car and not in motion at present for episode 203 of the Confessions of a Not-So-Dangerous Mind podcast. I'd like to thank you all for spending some of your late Sunday afternoon with me here in New York. My voice is better. I'm not coughing as much. You know, I hadn't been sick since before COVID. It's kind of crazy when you think of it that way. So it's the first time dealing with any kind of health ailments. So it kind of got out of practice. I forgot what you're supposed to do for, well, if you have laryngitis, what do you do? It's been, uh, by my standards, pretty rough. I don't usually deal with any of this stuff. And my voice is about 90% back. And as I say, yesterday I was just on and off coughing. It just fucking sucks. You all know that. But if you're checking out this episode on the YouTube channel, haven't done so already, please click like, subscribe, comment, share, turn on those notifications. Or if you catch this episode on the audio platform, such as Spotify or iTunes, same general rule applies. Click like, subscribe, share, and turn on those notifications. So for those of you who follow my social media, you know that today is another anniversary. And one thing I like about the on this days and the anniversaries of release dates and so forth, it sometimes will cause me to or give me the opportunity to spotlight a movie that I absolutely adore that I may not have ended up talking about were it not for, oh my goodness, this movie is now, as in the case of today, 29 years old. So on June 2nd, 1995, obviously that was a Friday, Clint Eastwood's adaptation of Robert James Waller's runaway, insane, best-selling novel, opened in theaters. And like many um, literary adaptations, whether or not they're actually good books, or as in the case of British in Madison County, uh, not good, but similar to Fifty Shades of Grey, although it has nothing to do with that kind of story, although there is a lot of sex. Um, in the case of Fifty Shades of Grey, it was a book where people loved it. Critics trashed it. By and large, critics fucking trashed Fifty Shades of Grey. Well, Bridges of Madison County, to an even greater extent, had a hardcore, a significant hardcore people who read it and said, oh my God, it's so beautiful. And critics were like, this is a fucking disaster. This book is horrible. It's horrendous. And so I read the book not long before the movie came out kind of wanted to get the idea of um, what it was all about because because Clint was already my, my number one person in the history of Hollywood even as he had just turned 65 when this movie came out so he wasn't quite a senior citizen during production but I read the book and the book is terrible it's terrible it's abs- it's rubbish rubbish um, but I I thought there was a chance that the movie could be good because the general, the basic idea of the book is not a bad idea. And this is why big hitters in Hollywood, such as Clint and also Steven Spielberg, originally Spielberg intended to direct. And with Clint in the uh, kind of pivotal role, he's not really the lead, he's the second lead, uh, Robert Kincaid, a National Geographic photographer. So Spielberg wanted to do it. And in one of those amazing historical moments, that you never expect to actually see a picture of. A little over 30 years ago now, at the 1994 Academy Awards, Clint Eastwood, who had won Best Director for Unforgiven at the previous year's Oscars, had the uh, the honor of presenting the Best Director Award for films released in 1993. Now, if you ask me, I'm a, a fan of Schindler's List, if you ask me who should have won Best Director that year, Martin Scorsese for Age of Innocence. I'm sorry. I, I, I got to go with Marty. Not that Age of Innocence is a better film than Schindler's List. It's like comparing apples to kumquats. But Scorsese's direction of Age of Innocence is about eight levels above what a normal great filmmaker can do. It might be his finest directing, not his best film, but the most detail crammed into each frame the greatest level of care 
on every aspect of the production. What Scorsese does in Age of Innocence, it's a masterclass times a thousand. But that's neither here nor there. Clint Eastwood was on stage to present the Best Director Award, and he gave it to Steven Spielberg. And not surprisingly, the place went crazy. And then the following year, Spielberg got to give the Best Director Award to his buddy, Bob Zemeckis. And that was a year that Quentin Tarantino should have won for Pulp Fiction, or Frank Darabont should have won for Shawshank, but he gave it to Bob Zemeckis, who, look, he did Back to the Future. Back to the Future alone should have won something, right? So I'm not really sore at that, but Clint gives Best Director to Steven Spielberg. And when you when you have the big awards back-to-back, this is so stupid, this is what we call inside baseball. They don't really go back to their seats. So Clint gives Spielberg the Best Director Award, and they go backstage, presumably, they take a couple of pictures, but they don't go anywhere. And now here comes Harrison Ford when they come back from commercial to give the award for Best Picture of 1993. Now Harrison, The Fugitive was nominated. Now, I like the movie The Fugitive, but In the Line of Fire is a much better movie. If I have any say, The Fugitive, the third act is not that good. First hour and whatever, phenomenal. But In the Line of Fire is a better movie, and John Malkovich should have won supporting actor over Tommy Lee Jones. Sorry, Lieutenant, uh, I mean, uh, Agent Gerard. I'm sorry about that, Marshall. It's just what it is. In the Line of Fire was a better film. If you were going to nominate an action arena type of film, that's the one that should have been nominated. And Honestly, I prefer what Clint does in In the Line of Fire to Harrison in The Fugitive. But again, just me throwing my opinions in every direction. Harrison Ford's on stage to deliver the Best Picture Oscar, which is, as we know, a huge honor. Whoever gets to do that, Best Picture is almost always a big hitter in the industry. Some years, like we've seen Pacino, Warren Beatty, that year where, where he and Faye Dunaway were given the wrong envelope. And, and Steve Harvey and all of that fucking shit. But it's always a big hitter. And it's a great honor for Harrison Ford. Even with the unbelievable success he had. He was, what was he, in his early 50s at the time. To give Best Picture. And he gave it to his old pal and three-time running buddy, Steven Spielberg. Uh, you know, they did the indie trilogy that was all completed by that point. For Schindler's List. And I remember Ford's reaction. I think... As much as he knew the fugitive wasn't going to win, he gave Spielberg a huge hug, and it was a really great moment. But then the three guys were backstage, the two presenters, Harrison and Clint, and Spielberg, the winner of the two big awards of the night. And that night, from what I can gather, Spielberg first tossed the idea at Clint, I want to do Bridges of Madison County, and I think you should play Robert Kincaid. What's your schedule looking like? I mean, I don't know if he literally said that, but words to that effect. So Clint's original intent was to simply star in that movie, as he had done within the line of fire, where he was more or less a hired gun. And that's a, a convoluted story that I, I don't have time to get into. That's an insane story on its own, how Clint ended up getting in the line of fire when Hollywood had pretty much said this man's you know we love this guy but he's done he's as a major player it's over for clint when he was in his early 60s but clint just wanted to act in bridges of madison county and he and spielberg had the same takeaway of the book decent idea shitty book but the movie can be a huge hit and the movie can really make an impression so spielberg and clint worked together on this project Malpaso Productions, that's Clint's company, and Amblin, Entertain, uh, Amblin Entertainment, Spielberg's long-term company. Uh, DreamWorks had not happened yet. It may have been in the, in the pipeline, but DreamWorks did not exist yet. So Clint picked Bruce Beresford, a filmmaker that he was a big fan of, who had done some terrific work, and then his movie, Driving Miss Daisy, ended up winning Best Picture. He wasn't nominated for Best Director, and I always found that absurd and even Billy Crystal at the Oscars made a joke, which wasn't really a joke, where after Driving Miss Daisy won Best Picture, Billy he looked at Bruce Beresford in the audience. He said, I guess the film just directed itself, huh? Like, Billy was a little salty. He didn't think that was okay. Clint wanted Beresford. He liked his ability to have big, like, landscape shots, and he had some earlier work that Clint loved that he had made overseas. 
they started shooting and they got Meryl Streep, which was an absolute masterstroke. I don't know if Clint always intended Meryl to be the co-star or, or the star, I should say. But after a certain point, I think it was about a month into filming, Clint just didn't think that Beresford had the right idea, that he was not he wasn't making the movie that they had agreed on. And these are things that happen in Hollywood, where sometimes it's not about um, dick waving or, or anything or exerting authority. Sometimes there really are creative differences. And you could have somebody who you respect tremendously, as Clint was a huge fan of Bruce Beresford's work, as I said. He just didn't think that Beresford had the right, the right vision for the project. Similarly, going back to the 70s, um, Phil Kaufman was the first, he ended up doing the right stuff, Phil Kaufman, so he was, he was, his career was fine. Uh, but Phil Kaufman did not, he did not, was not making Outlaw Josie Wales the way that Clint Eastwood imagined. So Clint ended up stepping into the director's chair. And the same thing happened here. So Clint, who did not want the responsibility of directing, was put into the unfortunate position of having to fire a guy who would want to, he didn't win director, but his movie won Best Picture earlier in the decade. Uh, I'm sorry, not earlier in the, well, it won in 1990, it was for 1989, but you get my drift. So Clint then took over the production. And unlike Back to the Future, where there are certain shots from the so-called Eric Stoltz, the six weeks of Eric Stoltz, there are certain shots in that film that took place in the Eric Stoltz when he was Marty McFly. I don't know, I don't know what, if anything, from the Bruce Beresford attempt survived to the final cut. I don't know that that's even information that's available because Clint, a pretty private guy, he may not have ever come forward with that and everything wasn't on the internet in 1995. I didn't even know about Eric Stoltz until the early 90s. That was not widely reported throughout the 1980s that, oh yeah, we had Eric Stoltz. Information traveled slowly until it did not travel slowly. So, Clint was able to make the movie he wanted to with no interference. And when Spielberg eventually saw the film, now he was not going to trash it, even if he didn't like it, but he said something very interesting. He said, I would not have made the movie the way Clint did. I don't think I would have done as good a job. I feel like he went in a direction I would not have conceived of and he knocked it out of the park. Having read the book, I have to agree. Now what, what Clint did and what he decided to, I think the screenwriter was, uh, or the, the guy who adapted it was Richard Legravenes, if I'm not mistaken. If I'm wrong, I apologize. But Richard Legravenes wrote the screenplay for The Fisher King, which is in the top three greatest screenplays I've ever read. The movie is phenomenal. The screenplay is even better. It's the same way that I described Jacob's Ladder. Bruce Joel Rubin's screenplay is the single best screenplay I have read by a wide margin. Fisher King is second. When I say that the Fisher, the Fisher King movie is not as good as the script, that's not a criticism. It's a four-star movie. But the screenplay is is somehow beyond that. It's, it's extraordinary. It's beyond anything you can imagine in a 115-page blueprint for a movie. So LeGravenez did the adaptation, and they had... He and Clint had a number of ideas, and the biggest thing they did was something that I that Spielberg, he didn't say this, but I don't think he would have done. They set the story in the present and then flash back to the past. And I feel like most directors would not have done that. They would have taken a conventional approach where you pick up the story in the 60s and you just go forward. The four days that Robert Kincaid and Francesca Johnson spend together, spoiler alert, sorry, and there's your movie. But they decided to set the film in present day and have a kind of framing device and a flashback structure. And I think the movie just, it, it works beautifully because then you have the other characters of Francesca Johnson's children who actually get to know her mother in a different light where first they oh my god what a what a harlot she was oh my god our mom was a hoe you know like uh, your mom's a hoe like Jerry Springer from 1994 but they start to see that there's more to the story than just the fact that her mother spoiler alert fucked the brains out of a random stranger for four guys and it's literally that's the book and that's pretty much the movie 
but it's sometimes life is more complicated than that. And I freely admit that there's no scenario in any reality that I know of where you can hang a film on a guy committing adultery and he's still relatable and sympathetic and he's still protagonist. We saw it also with Diane Lane in the movie Unfaithful, which I think is really good. It's Diane Lane's best performance. I thought that she should have won the Oscar that year. That's how good she was. Now, that's a little bit that's different. Her character is not as relatable. But the character of Francesca Johnson is not that she's miserable, not that she hates her life, but she is she's coming to the end of her tether to be the kind of dutiful, supportive, early 60s housewife, loves her kids, and loves her husband in a way. He got her out of this small uh, village in Italy called Bari and married, you know, they married. But she's not happy, and she needs something. And Robert Kincaid, in the world of the book and the film, he turns out to be that something. But by, by using this framing device that I'm talking about, you're immediately invested in the story because... Francesca's kids are apoplectic. But then when we go back in time, we kind of understand. It doesn't excuse it, but it makes her actions so much more relatable. And the other thing, the other thing that Clint did, which was unexpected. So I am a Clint Eastwood scholar. He just turned 94 the other day. And Clint Eastwood, if we want to argue who's had the greatest overall career in the history of Hollywood, I mean, I think that Clint is the easy and obvious answer from the perspective of actor, producer, and filmmaker. Triple threat. Nobody's done that to the level of him. He's not a writer, but it's almost impossible to find anybody who's been a major player since 1964 in Hollywood. It's 60 years later, and he's still going. He still has a movie you know, that's getting ready to come out called Juror Number 2. What Clint does by anchoring the story, by giving us these characters, his character of Robert Kincaid in the book is presented in a much more kind of alpha. He's not, he's not alpha in a negative way, but he's a guy who is more, he's a stronger character in the book. He is more vulnerable. And he comes across as more relatable, more human in the movie. And Clint allowed himself to be vulnerable, to be open, to be wounded on screen. He had done it already in the decade of the 90s, in his two best films to that point in the decade. In Unforgiven, where his character is, I mean, William Money is a horrendous human being who has reformed to some degree... And because of circumstances, has to kind of go back to being a horrendous human being for the sake of his kids. And then in the line of fire, Frank Harrigan is still fucked up about the fact that he did not act quickly enough to potentially save John F. Kennedy's life. And now another presidential assassin is going to take a crack at the current guy. And does he have the stones? Can he overcome his demons? Can he stop this guy? Or is history going to repeat itself? Well, in a world of bridges in Madison County, Robert Kincaid is not a tortured or haunted soul as Clint's two previous protagonists in two of really the best films of the decade, certainly the best Western of the 90s. I mean, some people say Tombstone. I mean, come on, give me a break. I'll take Wyatt Earp over Tombstone, but that's a story for another podcast. But William Money, haunted, troubled, fucked up, and Frank Harrigan, very deeply troubled and his life kind of almost spiraled out of control because of his failures. Robert Kincaid is just a photographer and a very successful one at that in a world decades before the internet or everything being on television. People knew the National Geographic and people in town knew that he was coming. His character yeah, knew that he was coming. That's what she said. But they knew that he was going to be there to shoot the covered bridges. This was something that the local townspeople knew. Oh, that's that guy. He shows Robert Kincaid. He seems tougher than he actually is. And he is presented as this sort of wandering... uh, a, A guy who wanders from place to place, shooting photographs, painting beautiful pictures with his camera. 
never been married from what we can gather, doesn't have kids, but it's possible he has a girl in every port, as they say. It's possible. We don't know this. We know he's a, he, as he puts it, he's a loner, not a monk. He's not saying that every time I go to town, I hook up with the first, you know, lonely, horny housewife who opens her, you know, opens her bra or opens her, opens her house to me in this case. But it doesn't mean it's never happened before. And it's not, that's not something that I really fixated on when I first saw the movie. But it is something that if you are Francesca Johnson, you'd like at least a little bit of clarification as to exactly what's, what exactly is going on here. But rather than be the alpha and sort of take her, Clint makes the deliberate choice to continually give Francesca an out and then give her another out. It's as if he was he was speaking on the fact that by the mid-1990s, the concepts of sexual harassment in the workplace, as uh, Michael Crichton and then the Michael Douglas movie Disclosure, and ideas of what constitutes consent and when should nature be taking its course, is there such a thing as that? This movie goes into areas that the book doesn't, as far as, yes, we know that Robert Kincaid wants to, he wants to compromise Francesca Johnson's virtue in the worst possible way, or the best possible way, but he is very deferential and yielding and backpedaling, even as he's seeming to advance, he keeps backing up metaphorically because he does not want there to be any mixed signals. He doesn't want there to be any doubt. If this is what she wants, it will happen, but not unless she is more than 100% certain. And Clint has a top 10 best actor moments of his career where they've had this wonderful kind of second date, if you will, because her family is away. It's you know kind of a uh, convenient plot syndrome type thing where the husband and the two kids are away at a science fair. And Francesca, lonely and horny, is all by herself at home, and here's the handsome stranger who needs directions to the Roseman Bridge, and that's how they get together and you know start a friendship in the first place. But at a certain point in what would amount to their second date, it becomes obvious just by Meryl's body language that she's not going to let him leave without you know, a little something, something. And he says, as they start, as they start to kiss, he says to her, he holds up and he very quietly says, if you want me to stop, tell me now. And Clint Eastwood, already more than three decades a star, delivers that line with such sincerity, without the slightest hint of winking at the audience. It's a very straightforward, it's a beautiful line reading. And Meryl, in that moment, Francesca is so hot. She wants the guy so badly that he's almost keeping her from getting at him by even asking that question. And then she pretty much croaks back, no one's asking you to. And that is the kind of first of what we're led to believe is endless sex for the next three days. You notice I'm not smiling because it's not presented in any way as funny or humorous. And also, Meryl was, I guess she was in her mid-40s. I think she's supposed to be playing roughly her actual age in the world of the movie. Clint was playing younger. I think that Kincaid in the book is supposed to be more like mid to late 50s. I don't think he's presented as early to mid 60s. So Clint was supposed to be younger it, it, it's not like a weird pairing where he's decades older or anything like that. But they then just start having sex. And they go about the next bunch of days as if they are a couple. And this is where you get into the idea of living a lifetime in a very short span. Or, and, I should say and or, the notion of Time is compressed 
and you have people who could be hugely important in the grand scheme of another person's life where they only knew them for a short time or only knew them well for a short time. And in a world of this movie, that's, that's what it is. They are living a lifetime in four days, but also they're having the growing pains of the early, the early phase of a relationship and the pain of the inevitable breakup. And where Clint, again, hits a home run is by turning Kincaid into an emotional mess, more or less, in a final act, when he realizes he is simply going to have to say goodbye to this woman. And he's not ready. And she's not ready, but she is more understanding of the realities. And this is another thing that they twisted on its head. The idea that the woman wants more, but she knows this can't go further. There's there's nowhere to go. We're done. And he can't accept it. And Clint, for the second movie out of three, not second in a row because he had a perfect world in there where he kind of plays the third lead uh, behind Kevin Costner and uh, T.J. Lowther as a child and uh, Laura Dern as uh, somebody working with Clint. But in In the Line of Fire, towards the end of that movie, Clint's character, as he's recounting the horror of the day in Dallas when Kennedy got shot and he was three feet away and did not move when he heard the first shot, Clint starts crying. It's subtle. He's not bawling his head off, but he starts crying. And that kind of cloak of Clint Eastwood invulnerable masculinity, which was pretty much gone with Unforgiven, was now really torpedoed in a line of fire. Bridges of Madison County, he's even more emotional and all but pleading and begging Francesca Johnson, think this through. Or as he says, this kind of certainty comes but just once in a lifetime, meaning whatever we have to do to make this work, we're supposed to be more than just four days. So I saw Bridges of Madison County in theaters the day it opened, having read the book and realizing that the reviews were good, that they did not make a terrible movie. I, I didn't really expect that Clint would make a shitty movie, but seeing the early buzz and the TV ads, which advertised a lot of great reviews, this goes with the all-time best movie romances. This is like a brief encounter. Uh, brief Encounter to me is the gold standard of illicit romance. In that movie, it's two married people who circle each other uh, near a train station in London for, you know, a couple of months until one of them has to move away. This is a very similar story. But I saw the movie that day, absolutely loved it, and really, it's the only, it's the only Clint Eastwood film in which his character plays a conventional standard romantic lead. Even within the line of fire, he is a leading man and there is romance, but Frank Hargan is not a conventional romantic lead. Even though there's romance elements, it's it's just not. And explaining what I mean, it, it I, I could go on this kind of thing for 10 minutes because this is a very, it's a very intricate sort of discussion. But in the line of fire, his character is a lead and there's romance, but he's not he's not a conventional romantic lead because his primary function in that movie is to protect the president of the United States and try to get over the fact that he fucked up 30 years prior. The romance is a focus, but it's not the focus. In this movie, it is the focus. And the great man from El Paso pulls it off. And Meryl Streep ended up getting an Oscar nomination for her role of Francesca Johnson. And there were people at the time who talked about it isn't just that she pulled another accent out of her bag of tricks. It's that she managed to master a particular Italian accent. She sounded like she was from Bari. That is how skilled, marvelous Merrill, to quote Sylvester Stallone, that is how skilled and how skillful marvelous Merrill's performance is in this film. But Clint, although he's not anywhere near the thespian of Merrill Streep, he does not embarrass himself. He holds his own. When his character is more emotional than hers, he does not shy away from it. He embraces it, trying something different, stretching, being creative, giving it everything he's got at 64 going on 65. 
And the film was a huge box office hit, way bigger than projections, even with the fact that the book was a huge, on a, on a, you know, enormous runaway bestseller. They weren't expecting 182 million worldwide gross for a four hanky weeper cornball romance, a story of adultery, basically, as it is and was. I've seen the film like three or four times since then. It's good. Uh, it still holds up, but there was something about seeing it in theaters on opening day and almost feeling a sense of pride that Clint Eastwood made that movie and got such a claim, stretched as an actor and as a filmmaker in a story he didn't even want to direct it. And what can I say? 94. God bless Clint Eastwood. Hopefully he has many more good years ahead of him and hopefully his last film, Juror Number 2, ends up being a home run. But The Bridges of Madison County, adapted from Robert James Waller's huge best-selling novel of the same title, released on this day, 1995, directed by, produced by Clint Eastwood, and Spielberg had a hand in the production, and starring Clint Eastwood and marvelous Meryl Streep. This has been episode 203 of the Confessions of a Not-So-Dangerous Mind podcast. I'd like to thank you all for joining me here in the car on this late Sunday afternoon in New York. And if you check out this episode on the YouTube channel, haven't done so already, please click like, subscribe, comment, share, and turn on those notifications. Or if you catch this episode on the audio platform, such as Spotify or iTunes, same general rule applies. Click like, subscribe, share, and turn on those notifications. I'll be back with episode 204 real, real soon. Till then, enjoy the rest of your Sunday. Peace.